Tiridates II was a Parthian noble who hailed from the house of the Araskids, a line descended from Parthia's very first king, Araskes I, whose rule began in 247 BC. The Parthian people had turned to Tiridates in their opposition to the rule of another Araskid king, Phraates IV of Parthia. The Parthians, not content to live under a monarch who had murdered his own brothers and even his father, joined forces with Tiridates to overthrow King Phraates in 32 BC, forcing the ousted king to flee his kingdom. King Phraates' flight from Parthia took him north of the Black Sea, where he sought refuge among the Scythians. There, in order to gain the support of the Scythian warriors, Phraates married either a daughter or a sister of the Scythian chieftain. After thus enabling himself to amass a new army, Phraates returned to Parthia, forcing his usurper, King Tiridates, to flee to Syria. At this same time, the East was anticipating the impending arrival of Caesar D.V. Phileas, as he scrambled to make new alliances following the decisive Battle of Actium. As Caesar marched his forces toward Egypt to bring about Cleopatra's demise, Tiridates had occasion to go before Caesar in Antioch. Caesar D.V. Phileas allowed Tiridates to remain in Antioch, but refused to commit any Roman legions to Tiridates' claim to Parthia's throne. Sometime during the years that followed, Tiridates invaded once again, and this time succeeded in reinstating himself as king of Parthia, but he was unable to hold his seat for long. Near the end of the 26 BC year, Tiridates' rule was challenged once more as the forces of King Phraates attacked and Tiridates fled. But this time, Tiridates took a prisoner. With his captive in tow, Tiridates made haste to journey to Hispania, where Caesar D.V. Phileas, now politically elevated by the honorific Augustus, was waging Rome's war against the Cantabrians. In Hispania, Tiridates appeared before Caesar Augustus with the kidnapped son of Phraates, proposing an exchange for Rome's support of his claim to the Parthian throne. The Roman princeps Civitatus, Caesar Augustus, took the unnamed son into custody and began making plans. Almost three decades had passed since Marcus Licinius Crassus had been lured into a cataphract ambushed deep within the desert wastelands of Parthia. Roman pride, still wounded by the loss of so many men, and still bearing the scars wrought by the dispossession of the battle standards which had belonged to Crassus' legions, was injured anew when yet more men and standards were lost as a result of the failed invasion of Media Atropatine, led by Marcus Antonius in 36 BC. But with the son of Parthia's king Phraates now in his hands, Caesar Augustus had leverage. With war against the Cantabrians in Hispania, continued resistance in Gaul, and a fresh Nubian invasion of the Roman province of Egypt all keeping Rome's legions busy, and with his own political standing in Rome still tenuous at best, marching into Parthia at the head of Rome's legions in order to rescue lost standards was not the best option for Caesar Augustus. Despite the fact that such an invasion would be wildly popular with the people of Rome, Caesar Augustus had to consider the personal consequences. He knew that as soon as he left the city, a coalition of republican-minded senators would likely coalesce to turn the tables against him. Neither could Augustus afford to publicly trade a Parthian prince for Rome's lost standards. Not only would such an exchange fail to satisfy the Roman people's sense of justice, it would simultaneously appear as if Rome had been forced to pay Parthia for what was rightly owed to her. What Caesar Augustus needed was the illusion of victory without the risk of being overthrown and King Phraates' unnamed son seemed a timely gift from the goddess Fortuna, especially in light of his present predicament. Following his near-death struggle with the plague that had visited Rome in the spring of 23 BC, Augustus had passed his signet ring to his top general, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. In what he had judged to be his last moment, Caesar Augustus had created division between the supporters of Agrippa, and those of the past over Marcus Claudius Marcellus, the nephew all had believed to be his chosen successor. In an effort to undo the damage, 
Caesar Augustus afterwards showered affection on Marcellus by giving him the right to stand for election as Aedile, by convincing the Senate to grant him the right to stand for the consulship a decade before the legal age of 42, and by personally funding a piece of visual theatre meant to emblazon the Aedile ship of Marcellus onto the memory of the Roman people. All the while, his rival heir, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, was receiving the recognition of the Roman Senate. With a bit less fanfare and the encouragement of Augustus, the Roman Senate invested Marcus Agrippa with imperium and authority so great that the general outranked every other man within the Roman Empire, save Caesar Augustus himself. Given the authority to speak on Augustus' behalf, Marcus Agrippa was then named governor of Syria and charged with retrieving Rome's lost standards. As Agrippa left Rome, tongues wagged. Some whispered that this closest friend of Caesar Augustus had chosen to leave the city in response to the outlandish attention Caesar Augustus had heaped on Marcellus, while others claimed that it was Caesar Augustus who had sent Agrippa away, disguising his exile as an honorable military governorship that would guarantee Agrippa was far enough away from Rome that the first citizen could comfortably groom his nephew for the future. But Marcus Agrippa did not make it as far as Syria. Traveling to the island of Lesbos, Agrippa settled in the town of Mytilene, an area well known for its natural beauty and its isolation, a quiet place which appealed to those with sufficient wealth as an ideal choice for the purchase of retirement property. From Lesbos, Agrippa sent his legates to Antioch. As gossip in Rome framed Agrippa's stay on Lesbos as a type of banishment, his legates, along with several Parthian ambassadors, made multiple trips back and forth between the Euphrates River and Mytilene, completely unnoticed by prying eyes. In Lesbos, Agrippa had privacy not possible in Antioch, a crowded metropolis bursting with Roman citizens ready to record and report back to Rome Agrippa's every move and meeting. After several months of negotiations on the island of Lesbos, a Parthian delegation representing King Phraates arrived in Rome. There, before the Senate, the royal Parthian delegation formally surrendered, publicly submitting to Rome's authority. By late autumn of the 23 BC year, another envoy from King Phraates arrived to meet with Caesar Augustus personally. There, the envoys requested the return of the king's son, as well as the handing over of the usurper, Tiridates II. Knowing that an alternate heir from the Arras Kid line would be a valuable pawn to guarantee King Phraates continued compliance with Rome's wishes, Caesar Augustus refused to surrender Tiridates to the Parthian envoys. He did, however, turn over the kidnapped prince to be returned to his father, but only after confirming promises that Parthia would return Rome's missing standards, as well as all prisoners of war taken from the armies of both Marcus Licinius Crassus and Marcus Antonius, promises to which the Parthians agreed, on behalf of their king. As a personal gift to King Phraates, Caesar Augustus also included one of his most beautiful mistresses. An Italian slave girl named Musa, bedecked with jewels, gold, and other fineries, quickly joined the Parthian prince and his attendants, all setting out for the east. By the autumn of 23 BC, the Roman people were finally gratified and felt vindicated knowing that the Parthian king Phraates had formally bent the knee to Roman authority by proxy, satiating their thirst for justice. As they looked forward to the return of Rome's eagles, and even the possibility that loved ones previously thought lost might soon return alive to Rome, Caesar's popularity surged. With the arrangement between Caesar Augustus and King Phraates now in place, Rome's first citizen needed to schedule a public relations tour of the East. During the following year, he would visit and inspect all of Rome's eastern provinces, and on an agreed-upon date, would visit the Euphrates River. There, at the demarcation between Roman Syria and Parthia, the princeps Civitatus would accept the formal submission of King Phraates himself, the return of the legionary standards taken from the armies of Crassus and Antonius, and would also receive all the prisoners of war who had been living in Parthia over the previous decade and beyond. 
With the quiet compliance of Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, Caesar Augustus would succeed in presenting a satisfactory victory over Parthia to the people of Rome, a victory accomplished with no legions crossing the Euphrates River and therefore no risk of the loss of more Roman lives. But, before Caesar Augustus could even consider leaving the city of Rome, lest he snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, the first citizen would need protection from his political opposition. He desperately needed his best and most trusted second citizen back in Rome, and amply rewarded. Otherwise, the senatorial foxes would be left guarding the hen house, and he could not feel confident enough to leave the city. Yet, in negotiating the return of Rome's standards, Caesar Augustus had necessarily made Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa almost as powerful as himself. With so much imperium, dignitas, and arcturitas, and with such a high reputation among Rome's legions, could Caesar Augustus truly trust that Agrippa would not attempt to seize power for himself? Herein lies the advice of Gaius Maecenas to Caesar Augustus regarding Marcus Agrippa. You have made him so great that you must attach him to your family, or you must slay him.